Hello fellow time travellers, uh, welcome to the next episode of my Love Letter to the British Isles podcast. Uh, hopefully together, I certainly do, but hopefully you will join me on what I regard as an unforgettable journey through time and also space, because as well as the years, we, we cover a lot of ground. Uh, it, it, the story starts for me around a million years ago in the British Isles with a set of wet, soft footprints in mud on the Norfolk coast. And then gradually through the course of the podcast, we get closer and closer to the present day. Uh, and it's the, the stories stop off at sometimes uh, expected destinations, you know, Stonehenge or Westminster Abbey or places that everyone thinks about and knows about. Other times less familiar. Uh, but at all times we're walking in the footsteps of the ancestors, trying to imagine what made them tick uh, and considering uh, the effect that the activities of the ancestors have had on the way we live today. I like to think it's got everything in it from, from the earliest hunters through the first farmers in the Stone Age, the usual suspects, kings and queens, uh, the brutality and the battles that they provoked, sometimes moments of, of individual bravery, many occasions of genius, inspiration, but all the time, blood, sweat and tears. It's, it's a million years worth of story. Um, and I, I like to think that it, it, it touches upon all the things that I care about and all the things that move me. So to help support the making of the podcast, The Love Letter to the British Isles, uh, please sign up to my Patreon site, uh, where there's more uh, films about how history and the present day run alongside each other, you know, separated by a thin gossamer curtain, but they sometimes feel so close together, past and present. So there's history, there's current affairs, and there's my comments for what they're worth on both. Uh, I put up a new vodcast every week, um, a film here in my home in Stirling. Uh, we've by now got quite an archive, there's quite a collection of, of videos on all sorts of different subjects. It's quite, a, it's quite an eclectic mix of, of topics that we run over. Sometimes we do competitions, Paul and I. So join me at patreon.com, search for me by name, Neil Oliver. I'd love your support. Uh, and in, in any event, I'd like your company along for the ride. But in the meantime, it's time to step off on the next journey, the next part of the journey in the love letter to the British Isles. Let's cue the music. It's very difficult for us in the modern era to imagine, to make sense, to make real the idea that we were for the longest time the longest time we were part of the European continent. That was just how it was. This week's podcast is the story of the biggest natural disaster in the last 8,000 years. Elemental forces, unimaginable power, charging unstoppable across the North Sea. A tsunami, the like of which has not been seen since. Out of the devastation, an island nation rose, the British Isles. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. In the last episode, we took a walk down one of the oldest streets in the world, where the first cave art in Britain was found. We're now in Scotland. Why is this next place on your journey so special? The Montrose Basin registers with me, resonates with me. I find it unforgettable uh, because it's one of a few locations around the British Isles where you get a sense of these islands being a work in progress something that's not finished. I think because we all carry in our heads, subconsciously, uh, a map of the British Isles. I mean, as I say those words, you probably picture in your head that map that you see on the weather report, that familiar shape of 
of the Long Island that takes in Scotland, England and Wales and then the neighbouring island of Ireland. Uh, and, and it's there in our thinking all the time. And it's tempting to think that it's a permanent fixture, that that's the way it always looked and that's the way it always will look. But you go to somewhere like Montrose Basin and you're brought face to face with the reality that Mother Nature has not finished, never will finish, modifying the place. You're, in reality, every wave that breaks, every moment of the day, minutely redraws a little part of the coastline of the British Isles. And that's a perpetual, endless process. Now, sometimes, mostly, the changes are so incremental and slight that we, in our span of 70 years or whatever, we don't notice. The place just continues to look the same. But if you step back into the geological time frame, then you see that sometimes there are big changes. And that's what's visible. The evidence of something of that order is visible at the Montrose Basin. Because the fact of the matter is, for the longest time, we were not islands. We were not an archipelago. We were a peninsula of Northwest Europe. It had been that way for hundreds of thousands of years. And people had been in the habit, Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, first of all, had been in the habit of simply walking dry shod into our part of the world. There was no sense of leaving the European continent and arriving somewhere else. It was all one piece, one continual landmass. Just over 8,000 years ago, however, there was a cataclysmic event, a natural disaster. In point of fact, it was the largest natural disaster in the world in the last 8,000 years. And it's remembered, recorded by geologists and others as the Storega Slide. Storega is a Norwegian word. It means the Great Edge. And it refers to a location about 100 miles off of the west coast of Norway and deep underwater where 8,000 years ago there was a, a subsea earthquake. And it's, it was an event of almost incalculable, unimaginable magnitude. 700 cubic miles of rock and sediment that were teetering on the Great Edge, where uh, the, the undersea profile goes from relatively shallow into much deeper water. A great block, 700 cubic miles in volume, suddenly fell off the edge, slumped into the much deeper water of what we know as the North Sea. Now, in that moment, a great disturbance was caused. It's quite hard to visualise because it's on such a scale. 700 cubic miles is enough material to cover the country of Scotland with slurry to a depth of 25 feet over the whole landmass. It's a massive amount of material and it suddenly drops into deeper water. It's possibly easier to visualise it in terms of, you know, someone in a bath and they're sitting in a bath full of water and they slip and they slip and, and they go under the water for a moment and a wave, you, you, you push a wave towards your feet in that instant and it slaps against the back of the bath, okay, or the end of the bath. That's what happened. So that disturbance, called the Storega Slide, 700 cubic miles of material drops into deeper water and a wave is generated. Now, because the water is so deep, the wave would have been invisible on the surface. It's too deep, but it travels that pulse of energy across the North Sea, heading for the eastern seaboard of Britain at the speed of sound. It's coming in incredibly quickly. When it comes into the shallows of our coastline, it rears up like the familiar tsunami that everyone has seen in a disaster movie of one kind or another. A great wave, maybe 50 or 100 feet high, travelling at those hundreds of miles an hour, suddenly smacked into the eastern seaboard of Scotland and eastern England. And it swept inland for a distance of perhaps 25 miles. Everything was suddenly and instantaneously submerged. And the impact would have been so great that anything alive, human beings, animals, anything, in that 25 mile deep ribbon would have been obliterated. Smashed to smithereens. As the wave did what waves do, it began to pull back out into the sea again. As it did so, it took everything with it. 
the bodies of everything it killed, it took away the trees, it took away the grass, it took away the subsoil, everything down to the bare rock. Wow. On this ribbon, all down the eastern seaboard of Britain, an unbelievably violent moment. Now, as well as killing anything that was within reach, as well as stripping away the topsoil, crucially for our story of the British Isles, what that tsunami did was finally to cut our connection to the European continent. Before that moment, there had been a wide land bridge of, of uh, dry land between uh, the south and east of England, yeah. reaching all the way across to the low countries of Holland and, and northern western Europe. People would have been coming back and forth across it, but in that moment of the tsunami caused by the Storega slide, it was flooded instantaneously. So... Once and for all, we were cut away from the European landmass. Right. We became what we are, the British Isles. That was the moment of our messy and bloody birth. Our apron strings to the continent of Europe were cut, and they have remained cut ever since. Archaeologists refer to the missing land bridge as Dogger Land, and for thousands and thousands of years it was a happy hunting ground. Before the Storega slide, it was dry land, low-lying, but a place where people would have lived, animals would have roamed, people would have hunted, and treated it just as another part of mainland Europe. But the Storega slide meant that it was cut. And it was low-lying, but it was dry land that people would simply have taken for granted. So they would just have walked back and forth between what is now Britain and what was and what is Europe. But it, there was no sea in between. There was no no English Channel at this point. It's very hard to get your head around that idea. You know, we take it for granted that we're a set of islands, and so we are, but for the longest time, we were not. Now, it, archaeologists call that missing place, that, that submerged Atlantis, if you like, we call it dogger land. Uh, and people who are, who are familiar with the, you know, the, the shipping news, the weather forecast on the radio will know about uh, Dogger Bank. Uh, so it's called Dogger Land because obviously it, it's, it's the sea now, but it's, it's quite shallow. And Dogger Bank, that, that shallow sea, just a few tens of metres deep, is very, has always been very popular with, uh, with fishermen. And the Dutch in particular have a kind of trawler called a dogger, and so dogger bank, dogger land. That's how that name has come about. And from time to time, over the years, trawlers, when they put their nets down and they bring them up, as well as fish, quite often they find things like a mammoth tusk or a tooth from a woolly rhinoceros. They find things in their nets they always have. And so the, the fishing community for hundreds of years knew that there was something funny going on, that they were, that they were pulling up the remains of animals uh, from the seabed. And the more astute among them would probably have been familiar with it or would have worked out for themselves that once upon a time, what is now sea was dry land, you know, where mammoths and other great creatures roamed. Uh, so for the longest time, there was simply a, a continuity between the European continent and what is now the British Isles. But in that moment of the Storega slide and the tsunami that followed it, that land bridge was submerged once and for all. It had probably been getting smaller for a very long time. The Ice Age, the last Ice Age, was at its peak about 20,000 years ago. But then from that time on, the climate was gradually improving. Uh, and by 16,000 years ago, 15,000, 14,000 years ago, animals were moving back into what is now the, so the southern part of Britain. Uh, but the ice was continuing to melt, and so incrementally the, the, the sea level was rising. Ice was melting, sea levels were rising, so Doggerland was probably being crept upon by an ever-rising tide, very slow. Maybe from generation to generation, people would have noticed that what had once been dry land was now a marsh. And then, you know, after another few more years, what had been a marsh was now actually submerged. So there was a gradual process of inundation by the sea. But the Storega slide completed the job all in one apocalyptic moment. It's extraordinary to think the whole of the British Isles were made in one fell swoop. What must it have been like for the hunter-gatherers who were here at the time? 
from that moment on, you've got a you've got a population who were who were trapped, if you like, on on our side of the Strega slide, and in that moment, they became the first of the islanders. You know, lots of people characterise the British as an island race. You know, seagoing, maritime. Uh, you know, we've made our fortune with ships and navies and trade and all the rest of it. Well, those hunter gatherers who were just far enough inland to avoid the the cataclysm up on high ground, maybe they were the first of the islanders. From that moment, anybody else wanting to come to the British Isles had to make a boat, had to find some way to get across. And likewise, anybody here who who wanted to go back onto you know, the European mainland, they could only get there by boat. It was a moment in which we became islanders. The British Isles were born. It's so difficult to even imagine what it must have been like. Such a massive event on such a scale, bang, and you're suddenly stranded. Yeah, anyone anyone who was in that crucial ribbon of territory or on Doggerland at the moment when the wave came in would have lost their lives, almost certainly. Talking about very small populations anyway, uh, the number of people on what is now Britain uh, at that time, you've probably been able to count it in the hundreds or a few thousands of people. Small tribes, bands, clans of, of hunter-gatherers who, who were just roaming around in that landscape, very small numbers. And so there wouldn't have been population density of any sort, but people who were on that land bridge, which we call Dogger Land, or people who were on what is now the coastline of Eastern Britain, chances are they were drowned, obliterated, smashed to pieces by the wave. But it was, and it was the people out with the reach of the tsunami who survived and became the first British islanders. It's incredible that modern fishing boats can still find evidence of this lost land. From time to time, for years, forever, when the fishermen were, were out and pulling up their nets, you know, they'd put down their trawling nets and they would, you know, wait and they'd bring them up to see if they've got a catch of fish or whatever. And from time to time, over the years, the, the fishermen have brought up uh, uh, bones of mammoth, uh, ivory, uh, tooth from woolly rhino, even from time to time, tools that have been made by human beings. So amongst the fishing community, there was almost certainly an awareness that there was a story to be told down beneath the hulls of their boats. They knew that there was, on the seabed, at some point in history, there had been animals and people. So the most astute among them would have made, made the connections with themselves and thought, it's a shallow sea now, but at some point this has been dry land. You know, so that, that knowledge would have been there. People, people aren't silly. People notice things and, and join the dots for themselves. So the fishermen probably knew that they were sailing their, their fishing boats above what had once upon a time been dry land. And do archaeologists go in, do they work in Doggerland today? You can't. It's chance finds. And from time to time, obviously, with more modern equipment, you know, there are, um, you know, uh, cores have been taken from the seabed. And, and, but it, it's a watch and see. It's, it would be, it's literally like looking for needles in a haystack. You know, you could, scuba divers could go down, I suppose. You could go down and have a look. But your chances of actually coming across anything are, are infinitesimal. It's just the case that from time to time, chance finds are pulled up in the, in the nets. Now, that event was 8,000, more than 8,000 years ago, and you'd think, well, it's gone. There's nothing to be seen now. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, a fact of life that we've, you know, we've, we're now a set of islands. But, but the point is, you can go to a place like Montrose Basin, and you can actually find the physical proof of that cataclysmic event. The Montrose Basin is a very large, in fact, it's the largest inland tidal estuary in, in the British Isles. So it's a, it's a shallow basin of, of seawater, uh, it's, it, there's a river drains down into the sea there, and it, it's a wide, like a, it's like a massive rock pool, if you like, of, of seawater, the sea coming in, coming out. Now, where uh, archaeologists and geologists, when they dig a trench on the coastline, on the edge of the Montrose Basin, when they go down a few feet, you find dark topsoil, dark topsoil going all the way down, black colour, and all of a sudden, where it has no business being, there's a thick layer maybe as much as 10 inches thick, of pale white beach sand. In the wall of a trench, it, it looks like a, uh, a layer of cream in a black forest gato. <laughs> you've, got, you've got dark soil below and dark soil above, but there's this band of sand, and it has no business being there. 
the explanation for it is that it's the great cargo of sand that was dumped onto the coastline by the wave. That's what waves do. They break on the beach and they leave sand behind and the water drains back out into the sea. Well, in the case of the wave that broke after the Storega slide, it was that on a colossal scale. And a great ribbon of the coastline of, of Scotland and the north of England would have, been, would have been covered in a thick layer of sand, which is dumped by the wave. But you can go to the Montrose Basin and you can find it there. And even if you don't go and start digging holes, which I'm not recommending people to start arbitrarily digging holes around the Montrose Basin, but the point is that you can go to Montrose and as you stand there with your back to the land and look out at the grey water of the North Sea, let your mind drift and contemplate the reality, which is that we are a work in progress. That the coastline, the shape of the British Isles, is not fixed or permanent. That's the way it is at the moment. But natural processes are still ongoing. At Haysborough, where the million-year-old footprints were found, that's another place where you get a, you start to get glimpses of the past. Well, in the Montrose Basin, you start to get, and you can think about uh, the reality that there was a time when we were part of Europe, and then that period came to an end, and it came to an end very abruptly, with a tsunami that cut us away from the European mainland once and for all, and set us out on the long story there has been of the British Isles. So where some people see a layer of white, sandy rock, historians and archaeologists are a bit like detectives. They see evidence and then they have to discover what it means. Yes, it's, it's forensic evidence, if you like. Uh, the, the whole of uh, the, the British landscape, it's like the assembled pages of a very thick book. You know, every moment a few lines of our story are, are written on the landscape. It's an ongoing process, but the older pages are still there. They're beneath our feet. And so archaeology and geology allow us to turn those pages back. So, you, you know, if, if the present is the page we're on today, you can turn the pages back and work your way closer and closer to the, to the start, to page one. And back down through the pages, you, you come to major events. And there was no more significant event in our story than our creation as an archipelago of islands. The fact is there was, there was a day when we were part of the European mainland, and that was the last day that we were part of the European mainland. And then the 700 cubic miles of material slumped into deeper water, 100 miles off the west coast of Norway, and the wave that that created cut us away from the European continent. That was the moment when the British Isles began. And what effect do you think this had on the psyche and the, and the myths of the Stone Age people from 8,000 years ago? It's fascinating to speculate on, on what effect it would have had psychologically on people. It's, I always imagine it, it's profoundly disturbing for people when uh, there's big change. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, when something, when there's a break from the norm, you know, I mean, at the moment we're going through this uh, outbreak of coronavirus, and a sudden, a sudden shocking change it, it affects every aspect of everyone's lives, and and we're going through a completely different. But we're going through a moment like that now. People are reevaluating everything. Well, there, there have been moments like that before. Wars, world wars, uh, outbreaks of disease have happened before. Now, eight thousand years ago, these people were suddenly confronted with a new reality where they had been able, where before they had been able to walk back onto Europe and walk for thousands of miles now they had an edge and they were confronted with the sea and if they wanted to get across that sea remember the land is now out of sight you can't see Europe so they're, they're confronted by a new reality now people never forget those moments they register and people then tell their children they say you know, there was a day when your mum and I were younger. There was a terrible day. And, you know, and the wave came and it, it killed so many people. And then here we were on a set of islands. And you can begin to speculate if, if sudden 
inundations of the land by the sea aren't what have given us the flood myth that's in Genesis, in the Old Testament. You know, the, the, clearly that is a, a written down version of something that had probably been remembered for a very, very long time. People remembered a time when a flood came and what had been land was taken away from them and maybe they never got the land back. Maybe land that was submerged then remained submerged and everything was different. And there have been these moments ever since the last ice age because of rising sea levels, ice melting sea levels getting higher. People all around the world would have been noticing during the course of their lifetimes that what had been land was now underwater. And that, that disturbs people. People are anxious because then they ask themselves, when will this stop? Will we, will we run out of land altogether? Is this a process that we'll see us all eventually be left swimming? Because they've got no way of, they've got no way of predicting how it will end. And it would have been an event that, that registered with the people who witnessed it, it would have registered with the people who survived it, and they would have talked about it. And it would have been a memory of it would have been handed down through the, the succeeding generations. And in other parts of the world, similar events take place, and, and some of them were eventually written down as the, as the Old Testament. Uh, there's, a, there's an even older story of the flood in, uh, in the oldest story that we know about called the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is written in Sumerian. It predates even the Old Testament account of the flood, but again, it features uh, a family who survive a cataclysmic flood by building an ark and loading themselves and their animals into it. It's an event in the story of humanity that is never forgotten. The loss of land to the sea. It's profound. It affects people deeply and it's never forgotten. The Montrose Basin is about a mile and a half, two miles across. What's it like when you go there today? It's a wonderfully peaceful place, is the is the irony, I suppose. It's it's a beautiful bit of landscape. It's this um, it's this little uh, inland sea, and in some respects, you won't see you won't see the the Starega slide. You have to you have to take that with you in your imagination. You have to go there and know that as you're as you're walking on that on that ribbon of land where the where the land meets the sea, that beneath your feet and not far beneath your feet, is still to this day that layer of of pale beach sand that is the physical proof, the physical evidence of that cataclysmic event. It's not unlike, I suppose you would say, in, in London. Uh, the area that was, that was laid waste by the Great Fire of London in 1666, even to this day, when, when uh, workmen are digging trenches to, uh, to lay you know, new telephone cables or, or fibre optic cable or whatever, sometimes in the section of the trenches they, they come upon a thick layer of black charcoal and it's the, it's the actual remains of the Great Fire of London. It's still there. It's still there trapped uh, b like, a, like a dried flower between the pages of a book. It's part of the story of London. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's underneath people's feet as they're walking about all the time. So you're walking about on the tarmac, and a few feet below you is the charcoal of the Great Fire of London. Well, you go to the Montrose Basin, and you're looking out at the sea, and you're listening to the seagulls, and you're looking at the grey water. Well, you can tell yourself with absolute certainty that just a few feet below the grass that you're walking on is the proof of the Sturega slide that transformed us from a peninsula into the British Isles. It's there. You're walking on it. What do you think the immediate effects were for these first unwitting islanders? Although that event had taken place and now there was a, a significant obstacle, namely the English Channel, or La Manche, as it's known in northern France, it depends, you know, you, uh, it depends what you want to call it, but there was now a significant obstacle for people. But it didn't stop anything. Uh, you know, people remain, continue to be curious. Uh, they continue They continue to want to see what's over the horizon. Uh, and, and so what it did do uh, was, was force people to uh, fashion boats, seagoing craft that enabled them to cross the water. They were worked out by a process of trial and error where the narrowest point was. You know, that narrow crossing point between Dover and Calais, that's always been the narrowest point. And people would have known that on a very clear day, you could, you know, you could just get a sense 
point to point of the White Cliffs of Dover or the or the or the French coast, depending on which way you're looking. And the most and the more adventurous among us uh, would have fashioned boats. They would already have been using various kinds of buoyant vessels for moving about on lakes and lochs and rivers and ponds. You know, being on water would not have been alien, uh, but obviously crossing 20-odd miles of, of, uh, of seawater is a bit of a different undertaking, but there would, there would have been and there were those who did it. People would have been, they would have been accustomed to using boats for fishing. They would already have known how to uh, cross water and the sudden appearance of what we call the English Channel would just have been a bigger obstacle. Uh, but the proof, the proof is there. Very soon thereafter, people would have been finding ways to come and go because nothing holds back the, the human animal. They're curious and determined and they, they find ways to uh, surmount obstacles and they, they, they find ways to cross the English Channel and move back and forth between what had become the British Isles and the, and the European continent. That, that process would not have stopped. so interesting on our psyche as a nation because it's drummed into us from a very early age about being a proud naval seafaring nation but without the Sturega slide we wouldn't be who we are today it's made all the difference um, we, we don't have all the other European uh, countries have land borders with one another and obviously there's a land border between Scotland and England, between England and Wales uh, between the north of Ireland and the, and the Republic of Ireland there's, you know, we have land borders but ultimately we are a place apart in a way that the rest of Europe don't experience we are a set of islands and islanders are different Pe- people who live on islands are just different because they have a, they have a different reality to deal with uh, and if they want and for the purposes of trade, for the purposes of getting anywhere, unless you want to spend the whole of your life on the Long Island of Britain or on the island of Ireland, you've jolly well got to get aboard a boat and cross the water. It forces you to be outgoing. Unless you want to be insular in every sense of the word, unless you want to live out your life on the island, you want to get anywhere. You can't just walk. <laughs> You've got to cross the water. Yeah. And it's also been a it's also been a moat around Fortress Britain at different times in the past that has been it has been very significant uh, that a would be invader wasn't able to just walk across a field and be in Britain. It was a bigger undertaking. Right up into the modern era, it's significant that there's a strip of water that keeps us separate from the rest of Europe. It makes us different. It was a crucial part in in, this, in establishing what would be the personality and the and the characteristics of the British people. It's such a pivotal event. Perhaps we should have a Sturega Slide Day in Britain. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Sturega Slide Day. It's it's always been fascinating to me. I've known about the Sturega slide for, I don't know, many, many years. I've had that in my, you know, in the way I picture uh, the, the history of, the, of, the, of these islands. Most people just take it for granted that we are the British Isles. Well, so we are, but there's a, there's a, there's a day one of that story, and it's the day the tsunami came after the Sturega slide. And it made us unique. It changed everything forever. Buried deep beneath blanket bog, hidden for thousands of years, is a snapshot of how our lives changed. Brought back to life, back into the light. Carefully mapped, a work of sheer dedication. The largest known Neolithic field system in the world. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles, You can follow in my footsteps as my journey unfolds across these isles of ours. Go to the website to see the places I've chosen and let me know the locations that inspire you. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Neil Oliver and Paul Ratcliffe for Fat Belly Films. Music by Malcolm Goldie. Additional research by Oscar 
Evie, Lucian, Teddy and Archie. Finance, Catherine and Trudy. Post-production, Althorpe Studios. Photography by Neil R. Graphics, Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. An FBF Podcasts production.